Let me have a prayer. Gracious Lord, before we crack open your word, thank you for what's going on in the kids' program uh, as they, they sing, as they, they learn from your word. Thank you for uh, the worship team that uh, gets our hearts ready to hear your word, uh, just for the great uh, song selection that uh, uh, really speaks to our lives and uh, the message that's there. But as we look at your eternal word, um, may it change us. May it make us the men and women you designed us to be. May we understand what it means to be your servants, your slaves. And uh, may, we take, uh, may we take that next step in our relationship with you uh, to, to be everything, to be extreme, uh, to be unbelievable witnesses for your sake and your kingdom. We love you. Thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you turn to the Gospel of Mark, I'm, uh, we're doing our best to make it through the whole Bible. We started in the book of Genesis, and uh, we've made it to the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> Last week, we looked at chapter 4, and today we're going to look at chapter 5. We ended chapter 4 with uh, Christ Jesus uh, showing his, his power over, over nature. And basically, uh, uh, he calmed the sea. He was asleep in the boat. Uh, Mark gives us uh, a more detailed account of this miracle more so than any other miracle that uh, in the Gospels. And anyways, he says, uh, he, he's the only one that gives us a picture that he is sleeping on a cushion. He's sleeping on a cushion, just relaxing. And, uh, but there's a massive storm going on. And of course, uh, Peter is the one that informed Mark, and Mark wrote basically what Peter saw at the time that Peter spent with Jesus, because the Gospels were written to give us a historical account of Christ when he was here on the earth, and they were all getting old, they were all getting martyred, they were all dying, and so he gives them these words to write, and Peter goes, listen, man, here's the way it was at the storm, we were all kind of getting nervous, and Jesus is in the boat sleeping, we're going to the other side. It's not that far, but good googly moogly guy sleeping. And finally, if you've ever studied Peter, he's the kind of guy that's going, hey, Jesus, what's up with you? How come you're sleeping? We're going to die. Don't you care for us? And uh, Jesus probably had one eye open going, oh, my goodness, there's Peter again, opening his big mouth. You know, I know one day we're going to be in the garden. He, I'm gonna, he's going to chop somebody's ear off. I'm going to have to put it back on. We'll, we're not there yet, but we'll get there. And, uh, and that's the way Peter was. And, and he calms the storm. But, but then Jesus reminds him at the end of uh, chapter 4 that, guys, you guys know I'm the Messiah. You know, you've seen me do things that nobody else has done. Really? You're sweating a thunderstorm? Here's, and, and they were all professional fishermen, so absolutely they were sweating. They had their friends died on this lake, so yeah, we're sweating it. But he's like, yeah, don't forget. Don't forget who I am. They get to the other side, and uh, uh, let's read verses uh, 1 through, I think, 20, where I want to go, and then we'll, we may continue. We may go home early. Who knows? If it's bad, we'll leave early says this, for chapter 5, verse 1, So they arrived on the other side of the lake in the region of Gerasenes. Uh, when Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from a cemetery to meet him. This man lived among the burial graves and could no longer be restrained, even with chains. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and, and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him day and night. He wandered among the burial graves in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. With a shriek, he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, what is your name? Then he replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirit begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place like the abyss where that, that's over. 
There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirit begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered in the pigs. And the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. The herdsmen fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as, as they ran. Uh, people rushed out to see what, what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. And the crowd began pleading with Jesus, go away and leave them alone. As Jesus was getting into, getting into the boat, he uh, the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him, but Jesus said, "No, go home to your family and, and tell them everything the Lord has done for you, and how merciful He has been." So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region, and be- began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed at what He told them. There's a lot to unpack in these verses with this demon-possessed, crazed person. As Jesus gets to shore, we see that the guy has great vision because it says Jesus was at a great distance and he runs towards him. And he sees who he is. And remember the religious Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious heat, the religious people of the day, they did not want to recognize that Jesus was God, that Jesus is Jesus, that Jesus was the son of God. But the evil spirits, the demons did. They realized it because they, he, Satan himself spent 40 days and 40 nights trying to drag him down, trying to get him to succumb, to, to say that, you know, he, he would worship Satan and it didn't happen. And he knew he was going to lose. The game was up. He knew he was going to lose. So whenever you, for you guys that have been with us and for you guys that continue, you will see that whenever the demons see Jesus, they know who he is. They don't want to follow him, but they know who he is. And they actually testify to who he is. But those around are like, yeah, so what? We don't really care. We want to continue our life the way we want to live our lives because they can't have, they don't have that eternal thought. And it's such a huge transition at this time, at this time in history. Here's the Son of God walking around the earth. So they, they, they arrive there. And, you know, the condition of this man is he is possessed by, evil, by an evil spirit. And, uh, of course, years ago I did this. I had chains and I just smashed them on a table and scared everybody. And Because... You know, your audience has become wimpier as you get older. I wasn't sure you guys could take me smashing chains on the floor or something like that, so I'm not going to do it because I don't want to scare you too bad. It would have been fun, though. Um, because just, you know, just terrible behavior. Terrible behavior. You guys know what it's like when somebody's around and they're just, you know, uniquely bizarre. Can I say that, you know? A few Wednesday nights ago, I teach, uh, and there's about 12, 15 of us, and, and we have this interesting person who just shows up out of nowhere. And she kind of walks in as kind of very different. I don't know how else to say that. And it makes everybody uncomfortable. So we got like security people here, and they just, they eye her down, like, you know cause any trouble we'll take you out in the name of Jesus you know that's just the way it is you know and uh and so you know there's one part of you that goes man this person really needs to understand God's grace and the other part of you is like you're really goofy um I don't know what to do I mean this church is full of goofy people but like that was an exception that's just like right John you were just kind of like, because I'd be teaching, she'd go, hey, pastor. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I just, yeah, car alarm's going off. And then one of the guys that just can't take it, it's just the fan, lady. It's just the fan. Shut up back there. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's a good possibility she won't be back. But she finally, she came back anyways. Anyways, 
So just so you guys understand that emotion that people have. Now you think about hanging out a person that's demon possessed and you know they're crazy. You know there's something going on that is totally not normal. And they would try to shackle him and he would break the shackles. You know, this is, you know, this isn't American stuff. This is stuff that goes on, but we don't usually deal with it, but it's evil. And, uh, uh, and it's amazing because like I, what you guys got to understand about the gospel of Mark, it's just a miracle after a miracle after a miracle after a miracle. Mark is like, like, this is God, this is God, this is God. Can't you figure it out? Those who have ears to hear, let him hear. If you can see it, see it. Why can't you just believe that Jesus is the son of God? Why are you messing? Why are you messing around? And so that's what he's doing. He just gives this, in this, this unbelievable part here, he calms the sea, you know. And then he comes to the shore and this demon-possessed person runs up to his shackle. He cuts himself. He's just crazy. And, and he's coming to him at, at a distance and, and with a shrieking, screaming, I know you, Jesus! You know, and the disciples are probably, ooh, weirdo again. And they're like, I think Jesus, like somebody told me the other day, they said, you know, pastor, do you know where Jesus lives? I don't know where. He goes, jail. I go, jail, yeah. Everybody meets Jesus in jail. I said, okay, I had no idea. But anyways, that was just a, that was a bonus joke there. Just in case you didn't get it, or if you've never been to jail and met Jesus. Anyways. Uh, all right, I got to come back. Now, here we go. This guy is shrieking, and, you know, the the disciples have seen it. The 12 have seen it. And then then Jesus says, what is your name? And when he says, my name is Legion, Legion represented a Roman force of 6,000 men. So this person is, his being has been overtaken by demons. Uh, when you study the Greek wording of this, you're not sure if you're talking to the person or if you're talking to the demon. And it's so intertwined that they really, they won't even say, theologians won't even say if it was the person or the demon itself. It's so, so close the way it's worded. Uh, Then the evil spirit begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. They knew of the abyss. They knew that one day Christ is going to reign and they could go to this and they'd be gone. So he says, uh, uh, there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirit begged. Let us enter them. Now, I grew up in Chicago, Detroit. I was in the D.C. area. We had a very diverse ethnic group. And we had uh, Jewish neighborhoods. And you didn't buy pork chops, bacon, in a Jewish neighborhood. The law in the Old Testament said, no bacon. It isn't until Acts chapter 9 when a big sheet comes down and, and there's some fried bacon and God says, go ahead, have some bacon. And they did. But up until then, it's unclean. So when you read the Bible, you got to go, why, 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 are, why are there so many pig farmers here? Because if there's Jews around, you're not supposed to have it. So what are they doing? Are they really Jewish? Or are they all Gentiles? Or, or they go, yeah, I am, but I'm just, I need to make a few extra bucks. So this is what I'm doing. Because there's a huge theological question going, who are you really? And it gets more interesting as we dive into this text. Because Jesus gives them permission. He doesn't send them there. He just goes, yeah, and what do we have? We have all these pigs that, bam, these evil spirits enter the pigs. And they, and they go into this, they run off the cliffs. Now, uh, I... I wanted to Google that because I'm like, it, this is so crazy, right? 2,000 pigs full of demons running off a cliff, drowning. And I'm like, this is so crazy. There's got to be other historical you know, evidence that this actually happened. So I Googled it and bada bing, bada boom, 1,500 years later, 
uh, not too long ago, some Israeli uh, archaeologists dig up a marble uh, plate that says, this is where the pigs, this is where this miracle happened. And I'm like, just one more stack of evidence that Jesus is Jesus, that, you know, we'd like to say, oh, that's crazy. But no, this is evidence. And even the historical, you know, world that is maybe far from God would go, oh, my goodness. They actually have a, a, a plaque stating that, that this happened. Ah, I never know what I do with my notes. Oh, there they are. So, yeah, uh, it's a, it was a 1,500-year-old marble slab. So this historically happened. And we have this group of people. Either there are a lot of Gentiles that lived there, or there were some really not real good Jewish people that lived there. <clears throat> Verse 14. The herdsmen. The herdsmen fled to the nearby town and, and surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they read. People rushed out to see what had happened. Now listen, if you just heard, it, it, these, these were the herdsmen. They're checking out the, the pigs. and all of a sudden, phew, They run off and they're going. I mean, that, that had to be something. You know what I'm saying? That had to be something to see. And so uh, Mark gives us this historical event. This is what happened. And the herdsmen just run out and they just start telling her, but you are not going to believe what happened. And if you're like me, and if you live there, you'd go, oh, I got to check it out. You know, I got to see this for myself. Right? I mean, I like, if it happened, I want to actually know what happened. I'm kind of a skeptical guy. So they all come running out. And they go, holy buckets. And it says, holy buckets. No, it doesn't say that. It said, a crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. Now, whenever they saw him before, he was naked. He was cutting himself. You stood far away from him because he was, he was kind of crazy. Well, he wasn't. He was. And they're looking at him, and it says, the text tells that he was still sitting there fully clothed, perfectly sane, and, it's let, and they're like in awe. Who is this? Who's this Jesus? Who is this? They're in fear of what had just happened. This could actually upset their lifestyle. This could actually upset, upset who they are. So there's two different responses that happen here. They see this miracle of God. They go, this is probably Jesus. This is the Messiah. But please don't interrupt what I'm doing in my life now. I don't want you to hang out here. I would rather have you leave. Because if you hang out here, I'm not sure how I should live or how I should live. Because this is my norm, and I don't want you to change my norm. I like my norm. My norm is comfortable. I don't want to be what you maybe want me to be. Do you see this radicalness that's happening here? And you're going to see that Jesus never, ever forces himself upon anybody. He doesn't say, you guys are nuts. I'm the king of kings and lord of lords. Can't you figure it out? Don't you know if you invite me into your life, you're going to be radically changed. You're going to be uniquely different. He never does that. Even though there's so much evidence that says, man, you should just say, this is the son of God and believe in the son of God and be radically changed and be uniquely different. But that's not what happens. They all get together and they go, Jesus, could you get out of here? You're really disturbing our lifestyle. We have no idea how we're going to live now because this place might become popular. People are going to kind of going to come uh, want to get here and see what happened. Oh, can you, isn't that amazing? I mean, it is just, and, and then if we tr take that attitude and we put it today and, and you tell your friends about the life change that you have because of what God has done for you, how he's blessed you. And you, God has done some unbelievable things in life. Wouldn't you like God to do this in your life? And they go, no. No, I, I just want the same Monday thing. I still want to color outside the lines if I want to color out. I still want to drink this, smoke this, shoot this, take this, go here, go there. I don't want God to be God of my life. I just want to be God of my life. 
And so when you read this miracle, when we first read this thing, we're going, oh my gosh, this is so cool. This demon possessed person, God sees him. He recognizes that it's Jesus. The demons, this legion, there's at least 2,000, maybe more. He sends them into pigs, but he really doesn't send them into pigs. They don't sue him or anything like that. And the Jews, they're probably like, well, we, we can't even say we own them because we're not supposed to own them in the first place. So they don't even say anything. But they hang, they, they fall over the cliff and, and everybody wants to come out and see. And they see and they're in awe of this Jesus, this rabbi, this Messiah. And they're going, man. And they go, but, but I don't want him to change my life. Could you please be on your way? And that's what happens. Isn't that amazing? You see this person that you know is possessed and then you see him and he's he's sane he's clothed he isn't cutting himself he's normal isn't that the most unbelievable miracle there is i think the greatest miracle is when you know somebody and then you know him before christ and then you know him after christ and they're unbelievably, uniquely different. And you're going, oh my goodness, look what Jesus did in their life. But some people say to themselves, yeah, I don't. I just want to live here. I don't want to live there. And so we have this group of people that just go, Jesus, please move on. Don't, erupt, don't interrupt our life. Do we got a closing song? Okay. But I'm not done yet. Just don't let you know. I got to finish this guy up. Because here's the interesting thing about the, this gentleman now, the crazy guy now, becomes just this normal person with these demons cast out of him. And he says, uh, Jesus is, is leaving. He's not making a fuss. He's probably a little brokenhearted because these people have, they just, they want to live in the mundane. They don't want to thrive. They just want to survive. So it says in verse 18, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. I mean, this guy knew what Jesus did. And he's like, man, I want to be one of your disciples. I want to hang out with you daily. You know, I've just. And, uh, and, uh, and Jesus says, no. Uh, Jesus said, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has, he has been. I mean, he's like, no, no, you, listen. You know, each one of you, when God radically changes your life, when he starts cleaning things up, you have got to ask God, what do you want me to do? I mean, this guy's first response was, I just want to be in full-time ministry. I'm ready to leave everything. And Jesus says, no, that's, that's not my plan for you, brother. I got these 12. I got some other 70. I got a bunch of people. I go, no. He's like, no, no. Please, this is what you need to do. You need to go home. You need to restore your relationship with your family. You know, you've been kind of goof, goofy for quite a while. You need, they need to see you. They need to hold you again, touch you, and understand that those demons that were, that were within you are gone. And then he goes, please, just go to every town and testify. Be a missionary. And tell them that really, I'm not that bad. That I'm a God of mercy and grace. And I'm not here to bring harm. I'm here to bring life. And, and, it, and it's. And that's what he did. It says, says so, the, so the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region. And began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. At what he told them. Years ago, uh, I got to lead a guy to the Lord here. Before he came to know the Lord here, he lived at the bar. 
And when I eventually got to baptize him, every, all of his friends came because they go, we never believed that this guy actually, first of all, goes to church, loves God, loves people again, and is an idiot. You know, and, and that's the coolest thing in the world. And that's, isn't that the coolest? Isn't that what God wants for us? He, he wants us to be changed. And, you know, you're going to have friends. You're going to have friends that even though they see you change, they, they'll be like some of those people that get us around and go, listen, just, just leave. We don't want to thrive. We want to survive. We enjoy the mundane. We enjoy our norm. Don't, don't mess with it. And that's the way it's going to be. So I, uh, I, 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 I want to ask you a question. I want to kind of get your minds to keep going and say, you know, where, where are you in your, your spiritual life? Have you said, okay, God, I, I, I know who you are, like the people at Gennesaret did, but, but I don't want you to interfere in my life. I just want to do what I want to do. Or you're at a point in your life where you go, ah, really need to be more in charge of my life. You know, I, I, I got to get knocked out of the, my mundane and just, what do you got for me? You know, what do you got for me? What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Do you want me to stay here? What do you want to do with the resources you have blessed me with? Just what's up? You know, because I think God's invitation, and he doesn't force us, God's invitation is, follow me. Let's change the world. Let's, let's figure out what, what his plan is for you. And uh, my prayer is that your heart, when you leave here today, you go, all right, God, we got to, I've been living the mundane. I just do the routine. I, I got to figure out where, what is that next step? What is that next step? And uh, if, you're, if you're like that right now, just raise your hand. Just say, yeah, I need to do something like that. If you're a chicken, don't raise your hand. But just me, huh? Nobody else is like, come on, God, what do you want? All right, just a few. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not easy to do. You know, the people at Gennesaret, they're like, uh, please leave. And this is like now, what, what do you want me to do? So that's good. Let's join hands as we do. If you don't know that, that's what we do here. Unless they have a bad boogery nose, don't hold their hand. You know, you even get kicked out of the nursery if you show up like that. So, Gracious Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. Father, that every man and woman who says that you are their Lord, that you are their Savior, that their life would not, they would not choose the mundane, that they would not choose to just survive as a Christ follower, but that they would thrive. They would, they would be impact people at the, where they work, where they go to school, and uh, it, they would allow the Holy Spirit to change them to be everything that you ask them to be. And those that are trying to figure out what you have for them, that you would uniquely speak to them through your Holy Ghost. Let them know what they, where they need to go, what they should do, Lord. We love you. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for uh, your grace that you give to us through your son. And Father, may, our, may we just continue to enjoy the word of God, the Bible, that it may soothe us, may sharpen us, may uh, just cause us to, to grow to understand your grace and who you are even more. Thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you just that you love us, even though we're ding bad sometimes, you love us. You give us grace. And Father, everybody that was here today, you knew they were going to be here and that they were going to be blessed, that when they walk out of these doors, that they're going to be glad that they went to church today. So we love you for that. We leave our request at the most level playing field there is, the foot of the cross. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you so much for coming.